you for the latest installment of our Road to the White House series. I'm Raphael Bostic. I'm a professor in the Price School for Public Policy and the for the Progression Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to, uh, to this uh, interesting, or what will prove to be an interesting panel. Um, this is a joint event that is held on a weekly basis leading up to the election. Uh, it is joined with uh, the uh, Jesse Unruh Center and the Dornsife College and the Annenberg School for, uh, Center for Communication and Leadership Institute. Uh, and it is really designed as an opportunity to touch on some of the key policy issues that uh, are uh, being debated and being discussed, or, or not, and, uh, and really give you some perspectives on how this is going. Uh, we've got four weeks left, um, and uh, it is truly turning into be a, a horse race. Uh, which I think the media likes and gives us something with a lot to talk about. Um, today's title uh, is, uh, is No Policy Left Behind, with a question mark behind it. Um, and it's really, uh, really raising the question about oh, what is the campaign saying about education policy and what should it be saying about education policy. And um, I, I want to start by offering a particular thanks to David Gastworth. Um, David, He's standing in the back. <laughs> David worked to put this panel together, so he did all the like work to make this happen, uh, and uh, he's done a spectacular job. He is a fourth year PhD student in our school, and uh, his background, he got a graduate uh, degree from Harvard, ed school there, and his bachelor's from, from Duke. Uh, he's worked on a host of education issues, and his goal is really to uh, bring education and the policy and management fields together uh, so we get some uh, deeper understanding about how it all works and how it can work together better. Uh, and so, David, thank you again. Uh, this is uh, really pleased and grateful for your work on, on the behalf. Um, the other person who I'm particularly grateful for is Bonnie Reese. Um, uh, as you know, uh, well, as you may know, uh, Bonnie is the global director for our new Schwarzenegger Institute. Uh, and um, did, did any of you get to go to that event uh, on the 24th? It was, uh, it was truly a who's who, and it was, a, it was really a, a crowning moment for events that here at USC, I've not seen that collection of star power uh, and firepower in terms of experience, um, maybe ever in my time here. Uh, and so we are very grateful to have you. And I, I also wanted to just note that you know, this, this panel and this approach really reflects something that USC has, has advanced and something that I think is really important from the Bedrosian Center perspective, which is partnerships with other centers and other sources of expertise uh, to make sure that when we think about issues and policy issues, we think about them as comprehensively as possible. Um, now, Bonnie, I don't have to give you I have to read your whole, your whole bio. It's a long bio. Uh, but Bonnie is a member of the California University of California Board of Regents. She has served as a Secretary of Education for the state of California, uh, a longtime advisor to Governor Schwarzenegger, and has done a whole host of other things in entertainment law, political advocacy, and the like. Um, she has truly been a trailblazer and has, uh, has really led us to some interesting policies and some interesting policy discussions. So Bonnie, thank you again for being a part of this, and I will thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Raphael, because it's very important, I agree, the, the power of collaboration is very important. The intersection between policy and politics and public policy is really important, so anything that advances that is a benefit to all. Uh, I'll begin by introducing our esteemed and, and wonderful uh, panel. Uh, to, the, to the furthest end, we'll start with Jason Pollack. Jason is a social media expert, filmmaker, and his current project, which you'll be hearing more about, is that he's uh, uh, directing is Undroppable. Uh, next, we have Professor Morgan Polikoff, who's an ass assistant professor at our own USC Rossier School of Education. Next down the line, we have Marshall Scott, who's CEO of the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. Next, we have Dave Rose, who's the de Deputy Director of the Parent Revolution. And right here, we have Edgar Zazueta, all right, <laughs> who's the Director of Government Relations for the LAUSD. Big job. We'll be, uh, 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 this is a fabulous cross-section of people uh, for this interesting uh, discussion. Uh, we thought it would be important for you to understand there are certain things that the federal government 
has power over states and school districts and some things they don't. Uh, and the governance structure between the federal government, the Federal Department of Education, state of California and states and local school districts is complicated but important to understand. So I thought we'd start with our professor to give a kind of brief overview so you can understand kind of how that all interconnects. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I should say this is a topic that I normally spend three weeks on uh, in the EDD course that I teach. Uh, the governance structure for K-12 education in the U.S. is uh, a bit convoluted. So if you, if you would go back, say, to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, education was totally controlled by localities. Um, uh, they were in charge of hiring and firing. They had their own budgets, which were based on local expenditures. Uh, that's changed dramatically over the last century. So around uh, the major uh, influence uh, in getting federal and state governments more involved was the push towards uh, the Great Society reforms of the 1960s. That's when Title I, which now is called No Child Left Behind, many iterations later uh, was first instituted. And the purpose of that was really a leveling uh, purpose um, to provide resources for uh, uh, low-income students. And uh, over time, that uh, has really um, gotten the federal government and the states more and more involved in the provision of education. So these days, depending on the state, the allocation of funds is something like 10% of uh, uh, dollars for education come from the federal government. About 45% each come from states and local governments. But that varies a lot based on state. And in California, we have a state because of Prop 13 where more of our money comes from the state than is typical of other states. And so generally, you would say that, uh, that the amount of influence is proportional to the amount of dollars. But recently, especially under the Obama administration, they've been able to get the federal government to uh, exact some very uh, serious reforms on states with relatively little dollars. And that's been because states, have, states are so desperate for money that they'll do basically uh, anything. So, that's, uh, and in California, it's way, way m much messier than that. Um, so, uh, you know, if you wanted to read more about yeah. <laughs> it, it's a real nightmare in California, especially. Um, but that sort of uh, gives you an idea that there are many actors involved in governance and funding. Thank you, Morgan. That's helpful. And, we're, and California, those involved in education in California say California has the most dysfunctional governance structure of any state in the country which is, would take Morgan and classes a month to teach you, but we're not going to get into that today. <laughs> but that overview, and then you talked about how Obama used that to leverage changes in state. So for that, let's go to Edgar, because he's the government affairs person for the LAUSD, which is the second largest school district in the country, and has more students in the LAUSD than most states have total students in their entire school district, in their entire, and, and throughout the state. It would be, if you could address, sure. Edgar, from your perspective, how did Obama's policies leverage changes and impact either positively or negatively, sure. like a state like California or a district like the LAUSD? Sure, sure. No, thank you. Um, I think the professor did a good job of just giving an overview, even in that short period of time, of how this interaction happens between the state and the feds. Uh, the last four years, I, I would say, have not been traditional in the sense of what usually is the interaction between the federal government and the state government. Just to dig a little bit deeper into what the professor said, the, of that 10, 12 percent that we get from the federal government, it's essentially the two biggest pots is the money that we get, what they call Title I, is for essentially kids that come from uh, low-income communities. We get more money for those particular schools. And then the obligation that they have to give us funding for uh, under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or special ed. Uh, under federal law, the, the feds are supposed to uh, provide 40% of our special ed costs. Unfortunately, even at its highest level, I think we've never got above 20%. So I go right into the criticism even before we go, but that, that's just one thing for context. On the other hand, uh, the, the four, why I say the four, last four years haven't been as traditional is where, when President Obama came into office, as one might remember, it was right on the, on the tail end of President Bush's uh, bailout to the banks. And then one of the things that, one of the first acts that Congress did when, when President Obama came into office <laughs> is passed uh, the RR, the stimulus uh, package, which essentially gave money to, to, you know, not just education, but 
throughout the federal government, anything it touches, there was money to try to get states to help their economic situation. Where that benefited schools, it, it had immediate impact. Uh, the stimulus funding, as we say, it helped to save about 8,600 jobs right off the bat. This was in the year where what we were facing from the state level, it was at the peak, I would say, of, of the cuts from Sacramento. So they helped us offset that. So that was one thing that- Gabe, to give the audience an example, how much was LAUSD, one school district in the state, looking at getting cut that year? If from the state, I, we, we had a deficit that year. We were looking in the five, half a billion dollar range. Not albeit, LAUSD is not your typical district, <laughs> but, but it was uh, Beaudry, which is right down the street, the headquarters of LA Unified. We like to say that, you know, that, that used to be the symbol of the bureaucracy. You know, you think of LAUSD, this 29-story building, you know, in downtown LA, and that houses, you know, personnel from across the district. That, that in the last couple of years, that's been cut in half. Just the people, that's just on the administrative side. That's not to touch on the teachers, the nurses, the, the support staff that were hit. So yes, that was at the peak of the cuts. The federal government came in and gave us some money to try to offset that. One piece that I'm sure we're going to talk about, one little piece of the stimulus package was some money that they essentially gave discretion to the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. That was kind of his play money. Here's some money that you could figure out what you want to do with it. This is what ultimately became Race to the Top and some of the other pots, where they gave us incentives to up our standards, to create new programs, to try to solicit those funds. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that. So look, I'll stop there. No, that's a good yeah. overview, Edgar. And, and, and I'm glad you just brought up the pot of money that Secretary Duncan used as Race to the Top which actually became more competitive grants. The earlier money, Edgar, you were talking about, there yes. were no strings attached yes. to that uh, funds right. to help lose, uh, uh, districts get through some of the cuts. And that continues to be a big point of controversy okay. in, in D.C. and amongst the locals of where should the money go? If you had limited resources, should it be into these formula grants or in competitive Okay. Funds? So the race to the top, as Edgar said, is competitive funding, and that set up competitions among states. Now, California did not win any of the race to the top money, but it did leverage states, including California, to some legislative changes. So I'm going to go to Gabe, because while a lot of states were looking at uh, changes in terms of uh, rating teacher effectiveness, some of the other assurance areas that states needed to put plans forth to show that they could be competitive and maybe get some of the race to the tops money was how are you going to turn around failing schools? Um, and the parent revolution uh, was a real grassroots movement of parent activists around the state, and they leveraged a pretty significant legislative change in California, the parent trigger. Gabe, can you talk about the, the role of the parent revolution in that, how it got organized, the kind of legislative change it did achieve and where that's at right now? Sure, yeah, lot us tackle. So, um, so our, our organization, Parent Revolution, uh, back in, we started in early 2009, so it was right at, around the time of uh, the president's election and, and the stimulus package, and we sort of were founded in this idea that uh, parents who are stuck at systemically failing schools should be able to do something about that uh, through community organizing, and that if half the parents at any failing school, systemically failing school, uh, were able to get together and sign a petition, uh, they should be able to force really dramatic change at their school. And we, the idea for what that change would be was aligned to the same school turnaround options present in Race to the Top. Um, and so uh, we sort of had this like crazy idea uh, that we called the parent trigger uh, law. But like, you know, we're in California, so we had no illusions over the fact that we could never, ever, ever get anything like this passed, right? Like California, if you follow like, sort of education reform politics is, uh, I don't want to say it's the backwater of education reform, but <laughs> it's sort of the backwater of education reform, right? Like it's not a state where we've been able to move a lot uh, despite like great efforts of a lot of really uh, wonderful people like Bonnie uh, trying really hard. Uh, haven't been able to do a lot of really transformative stuff in Sacramento. Um, a lot of the more the action here is in the districts because Sacramento is we all know about Sacramento. <laughs> um, so when Race to the Top was announced, uh, it was a, sort of a bizarre window because it was really like a, what seemed to us like a once in a lifetime opportunity to actually move serious, real reform legislation through the state capitol. For the first time ever, there's actually momentum from leadership in the state capitol and others to actually try to move a bill to qualify for Race to the Top. And uh, we, through uh, 
series of random circumstances, uh, State Senator Gloria Romero, former state senator, uh, uh, wound up putting um, this crazy parent trigger idea into the race of the top package with support of Bonnie and the governor. Uh, and I'll skip the story, but long story short, uh, we were able to pass this law, uh, which we just had made up sort of out of thin air, didn't exist in any other state. We were able to pass this really radical education reform law in a state that is like not known for doing radical education reform because of the incentive and sort of the political shift that Race to the Top created. Um, so it was really a powerful example of how the federal government could play a really incredible role in sort of incentivizing state level uh, action um, in a pretty profound way. And so uh, we passed that law that passed uh, in early, so it was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger in January of 2010. Um, and since then have sort of moved on to implementing it. Uh, we helped the parents in Compton become the first group of parents ever to take a shot at that. Uh, parents up in the high desert in a community called Adelanto uh, have been the second group of parents to, uh, to uh, take a crack at uh, using the law to turn around their school. And lots of war stories I could share, but skip for now. Um, the, uh, if you uh, are one of like the 17 people in the country who went to see the movie Won't Back Down, uh, <laughs> like you, see, you were great, excellent, all-star cast, pretty, pretty like good movie. I'd call like a B, B minus. Uh, like based, uh, it was based on like the real story of Parent Sugar Law. Unfortunately, apparently had the worst box office opening of any film ever released that widely. So like I'm guessing most of you didn't see it, but it's really excellent. You should go see it if you uh, if you're free. Um, anyway, so it's been so like we went from like this crazy idea, managed to pass it thanks to Race to the Top and Bonnie and other folks, and uh, it, like two years later, there's like a major Hollywood movie that was made sort of about this concept. So it's been a, a Dave, fairly I wild journey. I hear a lot of other states are looking at doing their own version of Parent Trigger. Can you give the audience an idea about where that's at, how many states are doing it, what the likelihood of other states implementing it? Yeah, so the idea has sort of gone viral. I mean, we're this like tiny little profit nonprofit located in downtown, right? And so. Uh, the loss after we passed in California really took off. It's now passed in Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana. So it's like law of the land in four states uh, for parents there. And you have legislators in like 12, 15 other states who are, and, and uh, who are working with community organizations in their states and parent groups in their states to try to pass parent trigger laws in their communities. So uh, there's, you know, a sort of legislative cycle window coming up like January through June of 2013. I think you're going to see a lot of really interesting movement mm -hmm. towards parent empowerment legislation across the country. Thank you, Gabe. How many of you saw the documentary Waiting for Superman? A lot more people. Um, just to give you a sense of what this wonderful organization did and the power of it, in Waiting for Superman, you emotionally follow parents of kids in what they call dropout factories, uh, that their only hope for their kid is winning a lottery into one of the high-performing charter schools. Parent Trigger turns that around. It gives parents in schools that are, of kids who are in schools that have been dropout factories an opportunity to take over that school and uh, do a variety of turnaround options. So uh, that, that's the power of Parent Trigger and how wonderful that is. Just wanted to kind of make that connection to the audience. Um, and I, th I thought we'd now go to the perspective. Marshall runs the LA, the LA uh, partnership, the school partnership. And that's uh, uh, the mayor's initiative to focus on a few dozen of the, the most high poverty, chronically failing schools in LAUSD, and through partnership and focus and efforts, help turn it around. So Marshall, can you discuss that, but also because the topic of today is the road to the White House, discuss it and explain how any of the Obama policies in the past years have impacted that effort in those schools that you see, mm -hmm. that Great. you're focused on. Thanks, Bonnie, and thank you all for taking the time out of your day to come uh, to, to this panel. Obviously, there's a lot of things you've been doing, uh, and. I think for all of us up here, education, uh, I personally believe is the most important issue in this country, uh, and it's the most in important issue for the future of our city and our country. So getting more and more people to get an understanding of what's really going on, why aren't we better than where we're at, why are we below 20 other industrialized countries in terms of math and science performance, and then what can we do about it, both in terms of an election in, from policy and hopefully for some of you in terms of a career. Um, so thanks a lot for putting the time in and, and, and coming out. Uh, as Bonnie mentioned, I lead the partnership for Los Angeles schools. We took over, uh, we have 22 of what have historically been the lowest performing schools in Los Angeles down in Watts, uh, Boyle Heights, and a few just, uh, just near here in South LA. Um, it was launched out of the mayor's office. And the idea was these are schools that for decades and decades have just had 10% of the kids at grade level, 30% of the kids uh, dropping out, uh, sorry, graduating over four years, 70% of the kids dropping out. And how do we partner between the mayor's office and LA Unified to do whatever we can 
um, to improve the lives of the young people. And I think that for this conversation in terms of policy, you know, I'll start with, I think that right now, both in the presidential election and as a country and as a state, we're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of talking about education and, and really not just talking about it, but putting action behind our talk to get us back on track uh, locally, statewide, or nationally. So, you know, there's a lot of talk now. You hear people saying, hey, we're, you know, 23rd in math and we're 30th in science and we're 19th in reading. Um, but the steps to go from those numbers to actually getting to back to be number one or top five are massive and we're nowhere near taking those steps. If you talk about, you hear a lot about closing the achievement gap and that's where I live. I'm, I, our schools are 100% poverty, 90% Latino, 10% African American. And to get those kids who are incredible kids, they're wonderful and they're beautiful and they are definitely just as talented as kids who live in different zip codes, but their circumstances to get them actually equal to the point of where kids in, in West LA or in the Valley or other places live is an effort that is far greater than what we are investing in it in terms of dollar investment, in terms of policy change investment, uh, and in terms of getting more talent, more young people to go into this sector and really uh, bring the, the, the firepower we need into what is an extremely challenging sector, um, but one that can is infinitely solvable because the kids are great. Like no matter where they live, they want to be successful, they want to learn, they want to be respected, they want to be appreciated. We have to figure out a way to provide that to them in our school sites. And when we've neglected, particularly the kids in South LA, uh, in East LA, and in, in poor parts of this country for a long time, for decades, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, what the policy has meant on the ground, so this, game, this work is all about marathon. Education's not silver bullet, we're gonna solve it tomorrow. And that's part of the problem sometimes with the dialogue. You know, you have kind of like the reform world over here, just fire bad teachers and shut down schools and we'll be successful and then, kind of the typical status quo world will just give us more money and let the districts do what they want and we'll be successful and versus like, okay, let's actually look at what are rational policies that need to change and what's the sacrifice that every single person, whether you have a kid in public school or not, has to make to get this on track. And so you gotta think about the sector with passion to solve it tomorrow, but um, thoughtful maturity to know that you gotta take benefits in incremental steps. We've met big success over the last four years, I think, nationally, uh, as Edgar was saying, with a, with a government and a, and a democratic government that's taken on some of the issues that historically no democratic politicians would take on that must be solved, whether those issues be things like, you know, firing the first teachers that are hired no matter what automatically because it's all seniority based, whether that be kind of thinking more creatively about tenure and thinking more creatively about, um, evaluations, but they're also just starting to get to the point, I think we need to do more on it, about how do we develop our teachers? Because it's not about, you can't fire your way out of this problem. You gotta lift up the existing teaching core. You gotta get more young people to come into the sector in a really serious way if we wanna have any chance of solving the problem. But the benefit we felt in our school sites is there's no doubt that the push from the feds, even with a small amount of money relatively, um, because everyone's so cash strapped, it's had an incredible focus for states and local areas and actually getting kind of those two sides, like I call it good again, status quo, aggressive reform to finally <laughs> kind of try to lead forward and get over this like I'm better than you, fight, fight, fight. And let's think about some rational policies that move forward. And what that looks like on the ground is, you know, we're able to pay our principals more to come to the toughest schools in LA, because that's how you can attract people to do a longer commute and a tougher job is you gotta you can't just rely on the bleeding heart. You gotta go bleeding heart plus uh, some incentives. You know, we've been able to um, get a legal victory that's been supported politically by uh, the former governor and by the school district, where it challenged that concept of kind of teachers who were hired, were hired most recently are guaranteed to be fired because that was crushing our schools. Markham Middle School and Watts, 48% of the teachers got laid off, got layoff notices the first year the layoffs hit California because, not surprisingly more senior teachers don't want to go to market. It's a tough school. It's just, it, it's not where it needs to be. So, and those are kind of things that, that we've seen good pockets of momentum because of some of the federal leadership with race to the top. And, and also I think because of some of the presidential leadership around let's, let's by a democratic president taking on some of the um, kind of more historically democratic policies that don't make sense while also pushing back on some of the more historically Republican policies that don't make sense and trying to find a good, just rational policy forward, which is what education needs without question, it, um, has, has really kind of, we felt the ground in terms of attracting teachers, being able to attract principals in terms of getting some of the flexibilities from LA Unified that we just weren't able to get um, five, six years ago that we're able to get now to be more successful serving what are 
a wonderful population of students and the vast, vast majority, a uh, wonderful population of adults who've been in really tough situations for a long time in terms of helping to lift up teachers who are, you know, without question, particularly in high poverty schools, have incredibly tough jobs and who've just been getting pounded for the last couple of years um, in, a, in a very, I think, non-effective and productive way um, as far as progress needs to be made. Marshall, thank you. You know, you're hearing from some of the, the, the very best thought leaders in education, not just locally, but nationally. And any one of these topics they're touching on, really hours can be spent on it. But because we know we have a limited time, we just wanted to give you some sense about what are the big policies, what's going on in the field right now, so that you're more informed when evaluating the candidates, uh, whether it's locally or whether it's for president. Uh, and just to touch back on something Raphael said at the beginning about the power of collaboration, some of these important changes that Marshall was talking about happening in LA was also with the power of collaboration, whether it was with parents or a ton of civil rights groups mm -hmm. came together uh, in challenging some of the legality of what some of these seniority only rules did, particularly to our highest poverty uh, children. And because Marshall started his comments so eloquently on talking about that these kids who are in the failing schools, who are a high percentage of English as a second language, are Latino, are, are, are African American, uh, but all capable of learning. Everyone on this panel and every thinking person in education understands that no matter what the kid's zip code or color or, or, or economic status, they are all capable of learning as well as any other child. And, and it's that focus on children that I want to turn to our panelist, Jason, who's using the power of film. And even though uh, Don't Back Down isn't seen by many, so many people raised their hand about waiting for Superman and the dialogue that created. Jason's focus is using the power of film and focusing on students and what it takes for them to get through things. So Jason, I know you have some clips to show us. Sure. Can you please share with the audience your focus sure. and the dialogue you'd like to see going? Yeah, um, so a little bit of background on the strategy uh, you're seeing is, uh, I, I actually dropped out of college and uh, was Michael Moore's assistant for three years. I made Fahrenheit 9-11 with him. Uh, and then I left and I made my first, uh, the first thing I wanted to do was make a, a film about the education system. Um, but it's a big idea and they don't really let 25 year olds do big ideas in this town. So I came up with this idea of following teenagers who are running for office in America and using that uh, film as a, as a tool to get young people excited about voting in the 2008 election. And so I made this film with David Letterman's company and Lawrence Bender who won the Oscar for An Inconvenient Truth. And that's, it's called The Youngest Candidate. It's on the documentary channel and iTunes. Um, I've been using it as a tool in classrooms and colleges and high schools around America since 08. David and I actually connected originally. This is our second uh, panel together. He brought me to Duke when he was at Duke and I screened The Youngest Candidate for his class there uh, in North Carolina one day in 08. That was, it was great. So um, I really wanted to make a film about education after that, but I had to like get my film out and quickly realized that I was gonna to have to learn marketing skills to do that. Uh, there was no more money for it and I was 26. They were like, great job kid, but you know, I saw quickly how there are a lot of movies in this town get made and they go into a graveyard of great movies that nobody ever sees. Uh, and I didn't want The Youngest Candidate to be like that. So I kind of taught myself social media in 09 out of the desperation of being a filmmaker, not out of mar being a marketer. And by June of 09, it was very different in 09 because it wasn't cool yet. And the, the playing field was smaller. There was a different noise to sound ratio. If you had a strong signal in 09, you could gain a lot of more audience than you can now. You know, every time a Kanye West joins the Twitterverse, like it's harder for the little guy kind of. Uh, and I've watched that kind of change around me. So by the June of 09, I finally got the film into the LA Film Festival and I had 60,000 on Twitter. And I did all the social media stuff that had kind of had never really been done before about around promoting an independent film. And then Ashton Kutcher reached out to me through the Twitterverse and asked me to work for him at Catalyst, which is his company in Hollywood. So I moved to LA for that job. It was sort of kind of like weirded out that this happened literally through Twitter, uh, <laughs> this thing that nobody understood. Um, and uh, worked for him for six months and realized that what I had learned out of being a desperate filmmaker and wanting people to see my film was actually super valuable marketing skills. Uh, and um, for, since, since February 2010, I've basically been an independent social media consultant helping different celebrities like Oprah Winfrey's company and Jamie Oliver and different startups that I like and not really using, not really using those skills to monetize because I think with great power comes great responsibility and I see those skills used every day to sell a lot of crap and it kind of upsets me so I don't really use them to do that uh, and I've been developing my next film which is undroppable. 
And really, since, Otet, since February 2010, I've been trying to get this off the ground. Waiting for Superman came out right at the beginning of 2010. So pitching a documentary about education then was just cold ice. And I was met with lots of no's, uh, but I don't give up. And I kind of basically was pitching this idea of running a social media campaign and making a film about education at the same time. And then I spoke at the Aspen Ideas Festival in the summer of 2011. I was on a panel there with Cory Booker, Mayor Cory Booker, and uh, Pete Cashmore, the head of Mashable. And being around all these big thinkers made me, made me kind of realize that this idea that I had been pitching in town was actually kind of a case study. And I coined the phrase social media documentary. And I started pitching it as, I'm going to wrap these two things together, a social media campaign and a documentary, uh, and, and tell a story in a new way for education, basically. So I've been running that, to, been pitching that since the summer of 2011. Uh, Adam McKay, the creator of uh, Anchorman, he's writing Anchorman 2 right now, uh, brilliant guy, uh, signed on as producer, uh, and then we got funding, and then uh, Justin Bieber's manager, uh, Scooter Braun, uh, who is also you know, kind of one of the smartest guys around right now, uh, signed on uh, as producer in uh, April. And so I've been filming now in six schools uh, through a partnership with the Get Schooled Foundation, which, is, uh, long, which was launched by Viacom and the Gates Foundation in the wake of Waiting for Superman. And I'm basically in six, uh, I'm in six schools now, kind of embedded in these six schools since April, working with their staff, their students, their guidance counselors. And uh, I have essentially sat in a room for eight hours a day for weeks at a time, uh, allowing students to tell their stories, uh, putting down their testimonials, and essentially the strategy behind this is, you know, I've seen a lot of content come out around, around education, and I don't think that content that comes out that says, you know, one political thing or another has really worked. You know, I've unfortunately talked with many superintendents around America who are not happy, feel attacked by mo a lot of the media that's come out. I won't name any names, but I've talked with dozens and dozens of superintendents around America about this now, asking for permission to film in their districts. And you know, you want to film in the district? Get out of here! Like, and the and and the worse their district is, the less they want the camera there because they know what their dropout rates are like, and they know that they're graduating seniors who might have an eight eighth grade reading level. So they don't really want the cameras there. So it really was a long conversation to get in. We're in six schools now. We're in a charter school in L.A., a youthfield charter school, uh, Joplin, Missouri, Joplin High School. That's the town that was destroyed by the tornado. Um, we're in Chicago, at a school in West Chicago. Uh, we're in Philadelphia, we're in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and we're in Des Moines, Iowa now. And so I've uh, you know, got to interview hundreds of kids, and now, now till the middle of next year, I'll be making this feature documentary that will premiere, and really the goal of it is to put a human face on this. And so the social media campaign, Undroppable, undroppable.com, which you see here, I am undroppable is our tagline, Every kid says that at the end of the video. We're gonna push that out and make it like the it gets better for education. Uh, working with the schools now so that they can embrace this. I've done a lot of all this myself, but we're giving, we made a curriculum for the schools now so that they can make their own undroppable videos with their students. And you can see how if we start to activate schools around America making, these own, making their own videos. And I've seen just on the ground level, if you allow a student to tell their story, and you get it out within the community, that's a real way to influence bullying in the community. Because a lot of kids bully kids that don't really understand what's going on at home. And most kids aren't really brave enough to talk about their story kind of in the moment or you know, wear it on their shirt, like this is what happened to me, don't mess with me. But this is a very easy way for these students in these schools to get their story out and uh, you know, kind of uplift them. And you know, Justin Bieber's manager's involved, Justin Bieber's tweeted one of the videos already. And so you know, a, lot, a lot of the kids have hundreds of views now, and so it gives them kind of a platform to kind of you know, get their story out there. So we launched this website on June 21st, and two and a half weeks later, Time Magazine called uh, and said they wanted to put a full page feature uh, on the campaign in the magazine. And that came out in the Olympic Special Edition and was you know, the biggest press of my whole life. And you know, this is my life's work, so it was, it was a big day for me. And then a week later, Time Magazine called and said, that Arnie Duncan had called them and wanted my cell phone number. And so I kind of braced myself for about a week and you know, got a call from him, himself, and he left this very nice voicemail message. And uh, I was stunned that it was him and not his secretary and many of the people in my team, we were all just kind of stunned by it. So we called him back and you know, I talked to him and he was so nice about it and he invited me down to DC to meet with him. 
So I met with him on August 6th, the day after my 31st birthday, and uh, uh, we had a, a great meeting, and then he invited me out to be the, uh, the only embedded camera on his uh, back-to-school bus tour, which just took place around America. And so I was with him every day on the bus uh, documenting his life and that tour for a week, uh, and it was an unbelievable experience and something that I never would have ever... I was really making a film about education through the eyes of these kids, and now I'm making a film about education through the eyes of kind of a lot more than, than just these students. And having him in the film and this access he gave me is just, I just can't even really wrap my head around it yet, still. So that's where we're at now, and uh, we're running this campaign. This is part of the campaign. That video might, a shot of that video might be in the film. You know, as we're doing a lot of press around it, that's getting folded into the film. Um, and we're going to grow this network. Undroppable is for every student and for every school in the world. And so we want this to go global. What, what I wanted to do with these first six schools was show the online model so that people could get it. Because when we were trying to get these first six so hard without showing the model, because this has never been done before, and people thought I was crazy. But so now you can see it and you can feel it. Um, so I'm just going to play one video for you guys. Uh, this is the video that Justin Bieber tweeted. When I was seven years old, we were all sleeping, and it was about one, two o'clock in the morning, and we heard people knocking on the door really hard, and they just kept saying, police, police, and they knocked on our door, and every, there was just a group of people that just went in, they had everybody go to the living room. And my dad was downstairs. And it was about three people that had him and putting him in handcuffs. He was laying on the kitchen floor and we were looking at him. My mind just went blank. I started like crying. I didn't know why things were happening this way. Going into high school, I would push myself, try to go beyond and try and get my grades up and everything, but sometimes I would fall back because my mom, we would like move every month or every week here and there and she'd have fights with her boyfriend. She'd get beat sometimes and we'd have to like make reports to the police. It's not like I could step in there or anything, so I'd always be like scared. It's really hard to see your mom get hurt, right? Is that the hardest part? Yeah. You're going through so much, but you're gonna, you're succeeding. How do you, how do you find strength to do that? Um, I try and, um, I want kind of better for myself. And now, like, getting pregnant, I, I got pregnant at, um, 16, and then I turned 17. And I um, want it better for my daughter. So, um, so I push myself. My name is Cynthia Gallardo, and I am undroppable. When we talk about an at risk kid, normally we label them that because they're at risk of dropping out, but they're really at risk, period, you know? and. What I'm trying to do with this is kind of get above the politics of it all and just say, look at these kids. Like, how can we be giving them what we're giving them right now when these are their realities? You know, a common talking point for politicians is, well, it doesn't matter how, many, how, many, how much money each student has because that, we've looked into that and money per student doesn't really mean anything because there are some schools that are performing and they don't have as much money as other students. Well, the reality is if, if you're Cynthia and you're coming to school hungry every day or you're moving around every day, you literally do need and deserve more money than another student. And you know, I think hopefully this content getting out there more and more you know, I, I watch the media very closely. I don't really feel like anyone is, is doing this right now. I think it's very important to this conversation. And, um, you know, we're going to try to stay as non, we're going to stay nonpartisan over here and just 
you know, get Cynthia's out there as much as possible, as well as the teachers. We have amazing teacher clips that are online too. And you know, what I'm trying to show is that these are people on the front lines of a war. Mm -hmm. And there's a war zone in America, and we don't want to admit that to ourselves. But Cynthia has the same story as, as students in Iraq and Afghanistan, whose, whose houses are raided in the middle of the night by men with guns and watch their parents taken out in their underwear and handcuffs. Mm -hmm. And that affects you. You know, and it stops you from getting to school. Mm -hmm. And it's very illogical why it would stop you from getting to school. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like we just need to give these areas a lot more compassion that they're getting. And it's, you know, wonderful to be on this panel with people that are also on the front lines of this helping that happen. Well, I, 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 another thing you're seeing is the importance of people care, brilliant people like this caring on the many different fronts. This battle for better education needs to be waged. And, um, and Jason, you, you, you talk about uh, we're gonna, we, that it's money matters. And to quote the brilliant John Daisy who runs the LAUSD, he says money most definitely matters and, how, uh, and especially how you use that money matters. Um, and, uh, but while you're, and we your work is brilliant, and while we applaud you, the power of this to keep that out there so that everyone focuses on what are the needs of so many kids in schools in America. And your desire to stay nonpartisan and nonpolitical about it is brilliant. But now back to the topic of this panel, which is Road to the White House. And we will shift to those that do need to focus on does it matter? Will one candidate versus another's policies more benefit schools than another? So let's, uh, before we turn it open to questions from the audience, I'd like to see if anyone on this panel, maybe our professor or, or anyone in the government affairs, can address what publicly stated platform of Romney's versus Obama's, what are the key differences in what, uh, uh, what Governor Romney is, is promoting in terms of what his education policies are and Obama? Um, yeah, I can touch on, okay. I can talk about and a few things. So, uh, I mean, one of the things that we heard already is that, the, that this Department of Education, led by Arne Duncan, has been very activist and very involved in influencing policy in the states. And so one of the things that President Ron, uh, President, oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, uh, ex-Governor Romney uh, is saying is that he would, uh, is that he would get the DOE to be less involved in, in pushing things like the Common Core Standards. So the Obama administration and the DOE really pushed 46 states to adopt the Common Core Standards through the Race to the Top movement. Now, a lot, uh, a lot of states were going to adopt it anyway, but um, uh, the Romney uh, candidate has uh, said that he would try and rein that in. And I think uh, that's not surprising. Historically, the Republican Party has not been uh, super enthralled with the U.S. Department of Education, and many in the Republican Party have advocated for uh, uh, abolishing the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and uh, uh, a couple other, uh, I mean, in general, you would say that on this issue that Obama and Romney are actually not that far apart on education as compared to some other issues. Um, but another uh, small distinction is uh, that, uh, that uh, candidate Romney is, uh, is more supportive of school choice uh, in the form of vouchers, um, giving uh, parents and uh, families the money, say the, ti the actual Title I dollars, and letting those parents choose a school, which could be a private school, as opposed to uh, President Obama, who has been, uh, especially for a Democrat, quite uh, in support of charter schools, which are another variety of school choice that keeps parents in public schools, um, but they're public charter schools. I'm very glad that he brought that up, because really, most of the conversation and the leaders here today were focusing on K through 12 public yeah. education and not on higher public education. Um, and of course, Pell Grants is a key issue in higher education, as you all know. Uh, in California, we have Cal Grants. Uh, and also, uh, the Obama administration has taken over uh, the student loan uh, function from banks. But we're not going to, uh, we're really not going to have the time to totally get into that here today. But back to other key differences. Edgar, I'll if you add could one, address. Yeah, I'll add one more. I mean, I think on the policy, and I think that's part of the professor mentioned the whole notion of using these. Uh, these uh, formula do dollars that we get in form of Title I or for special ed 
and giving essentially the parent access to those funds and letting them choose the school of their choice would be a pretty big departure from what we have in current law today. It's vague how that would work. Uh, and then uh, to the other topic of funding, there are obviously probably bigger differences in terms of funding. On one end, uh, Governor Romney has uh, picked a, a vice presidential candidate, uh, Congressman Ryan, who in, in Congress put out a plan that slashed education programs by 20% across the board. That includes Pell Grant, that includes a lot of the programs that uh, impact higher ed. As many of you probably heard on the, uh, and, and during the debate, Romney was pretty public about saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to cut those programs. So now in the days after the debate, that's been the big, well, how? <laughs> how do these numbers add up? Because on one end, the governor is saying that we're not going to increase the deficit. We're going to protect Medicare. We're going to protect defense. We're going to protect all this. He doesn't want to see any new revenues, but he's also not going to cut education. So then you may have a, a numbers game. So that's a big question. I mean, from our standpoint, if Governor Romney is, is elected president, we're going to hope he st you know, sticks to his word and that we're not going to see further cuts. There are some pretty dramatic federal cuts. On top of it, there's a lot of issues on the November statewide ballot that I encourage you, all you California voters, to do your research on that. But also on the federal end, this uh, January, Congress last year put together this super committee that was supposed to reduce the federal deficit by $1.4 trillion. And if they didn't, a number of trigger cuts were going to go into effect. One of those trigger cuts, it's going to cut education programs by approximately 10%, 8 or 9%, to be more exact. Well, here you have a big fight over between the Democrats and Republicans. Republicans in general in Congress want to protect the defense programs, they, because this applies to all federal programs. Democrats say, well, we won't, we won't uh, think about exempting the defense programs unless you roll in education, health, everything else that is impacted by federal funding. This is going to be one, I think, of the key issues, regardless of which presidential candidate mm -hmm. gets elected in November. Thank, thank you, Edgar. Bonnie, just one quick point on the election, and it's, you know, it may be too late right now, but I think following Jason's uh, nonpartisan direction, it's just not talked about enough around the election. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line is if you look at the amount of time in the debate, if you look at the amount of time, if you go to both candidates' websites, if you look at what policy platform is being talked about, education is nowhere near where it needs to be given that we all know it's so essential for this country. And, and even in pre-election, and I'm a, I'm a big supporter of, of President Obama, but pre-election, you look at the state, of the state of the unions for the last several years, you're talking like 1 20th of the time is actually spent on education. So I think the gap we have to make up in this country, and it's, it's nationally and it's locally and it's statewide, is everyone like the conversation of, oh, we gotta fix our schools, we gotta be number one. Everyone's good at that conversation. The next conversation about what's it actually going to take to get there with serious and intense focus mm -hmm. on all the real big issues that are preventing us from moving forward, that is still not talked about anywhere near, and it's a big gap in this presidential election. Probably nothing we can do about that now, but I think going forward, any politician, whether it's a mayor, state assembly, state senate, governor, mm -hmm. senator, uh, future presidential candidates, absolute requirement to get serious about this education issue right. and talking about it uh, and, and taking action on it in a much larger way. Obama's gone further as any Democratic president, but still nowhere near where we need to get to if we want to get serious about actually closing the achievement right. gap, actually becoming number one internationally, which is where we need to be. And on the one hand, while some commentators can say you know, they understand it because of the serious economic conditions and joblessness and housing and an economic crisis facing people, families, states, and our nation, what, what education advocates encourage everyone to understand is make that connection. Because if we don't focus on strong education in this country, those issues of homelessness and joblessness and economic well-being will only get worse, not better. It's a guarantee. So making that connection is important. And before I open up to I just have to say, well, Jason, I, I'd love to think that funding Pell Grants and funding education is nonpartisan. And maybe it's nonpartisan. I wish but, it was. Right. But there's, there are obvious differences between particular candidates, whether it's mayors, senators, governors, president. And it comes to, like what Edgar said, funding priorities. And we see that more when budgets are, are, are tight like they are now than in, 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 in economically good times in terms of what are our candidates' priorities. And, uh, right. and with limited amount of funds, some might prioritize education more than other issues. And that's important for an informed electorate to be aware of. 
And with this excellent uh, discussion, I think let's, uh, let's open it up for the remaining time to, uh, to people in the audience to ask questions of our wonderful panel. Uh, my, I just wanted to know, I mean, I'm not as informed about it, so you said that you signed a petition that half the parents signed a petition that they are able to force change, like what kind of change, where does the money come from? Cool, no great question. So, uh, so the way it works in California is uh, parents can choose from any one of the four turnaround options and race to the top slash no child left behind. So they can, um, you know, require the, the quote unquote turnaround option where they can essentially require the district to bring in a, a mostly new staff. There's the transformation option where they bring in a new principal and make some other sort of policy changes at the school. There's charter conversion where they can bring in different management. Um, and then there's school closure, which don't really see parents ever like petitioning to close their own school, so it's not something we ever talk about or uh, work with parents on. Um, uh, but important to note that like, so none of, like obviously anyone who pays attention to public education understands that like none of those three or four things on their own, or you, there's no like add water and stir solution to a systemically failing school, right? Like don't, don't have to tell Marshall that. Um, there's no harder work in public education, the work Marshall and, and his team are doing every single day, and, and the district is doing, and countless other people, trying to turn around systemically failing schools, it's enormously difficult. Um, so it's not, the theory of change is not that, oh, if parents just get together, sign a petition, turn this in, then some big things will change, then like, great, we're done, and like, the school will be great. The idea is that, look, education, we like to pretend that because children are involved, there's no politics in public education, right? And we should all just do the right thing because it's about kids, right? But like, in the real world, there's lots of power at stake and lots of money at stake and lots of different interest groups, just like every other sector of American society. And a lot of times it comes down to politics and adult interests, not kid interests. And so uh, we think that we need to get to a place where every decision in public education is made about uh, based on the best, best interests of children, period. And we think the only way to do that is not to just keep asking the powers that be nicely over and over again to do that, because even great people inside the system are constrained by the system. And so the theory of change is we need to transfer some, not all, but some of the power currently held by other folks to parents. And Parent Trigger is a tool to do that. It gives parents real leverage and bargaining power for the first time ever, not just to go sign some petitions and turn them in, but to force other people to take them seriously, which has never happened. And, an and as another simpler, uh, another simple way to also look at what's going on is if you, let's just simplistically, because funding is very complicated, but let's simplistically say that uh, the average per pupil expenditure is $10,000 a year, just to give you a rounded number and simplistic. And let's say you have 500 kids at a failing school, 10,000 times 500 kids. Do parents get together and say, that's where the funding comes from. It's currently going to that school, right, for all their expenses. So basically, it's saying to these schools that are chronically failing, when enough parents get together, and, and everyone knows that students always do better when you have parent support and community support. So Parent Revolution helps provide that, because it is ongoing. There is no simple solution. But it's saying to that community of parents and students and community churches and others in that community with that failing school that this pot of money is going to this school. If we take this pot of money and we organize, is there a way we can effectively do better? Either by saying we're going to give the five million dollars coming to run this school, is there a charter organization that feels they could do a better job? Come, show us a plan how you could take over this school with the money currently going there and do a better job for our kids. Or is there a way for us to work with advisors on getting another school principal and keeping the best teachers and organizing around that to, to use that money more effectively? That, that's another way to look at it. Hi. Um, my question is about partnerships, since all of you represent very different kind of sectors or types of work within the sector. What are your comments optimistically about the types of partnerships across these types of organizations and also where is there room for work? Uh, yeah, so there, there's tons of room for work uh, because we just have a long way to go. I think that ultimately the, the problem of educating a child at the core of it requires partnership to solve it, right? Because some of that education is happening at home, some of that education is actually happening at a school site with teachers and principals, some of that education is related to social services, as was mentioned, like health, food, et cetera. Some of that's related to safety and public safety around what's going on in the community. So like when we launched the partnership for LA schools, the idea was LA Unified alone for 
Markham Middle School and Rosewood High School just wasn't enough, that you had to actually had to take the best that LA Unified had to offer, plus support from a mayor's office, plus support from local both ad, 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 advocacy groups and local service providers that were doing social emotional supports for kids that have some really traumatic families and other service providers that are helping their actual parents and families and otherwise. So it's essential when you think about lifting up a child to, to leverage partnerships. Now what people forget about partnerships is, you, know, you have some folks that say, hey, when there's less money, go partner more. Quality partnerships actually require time, energy, and resource to put in place. You can't just close your eyes, click your heels, and say, I'm going to partner and it's going to work. you got to invest money, time, and people in that. And so I think we underinvest in partnerships, and particularly with nonprofits. Funders are very, very like, what's the exact program I'm paying for? They're very focused on that. They're less focused on, let's invest in some human capital to really define and implement a high-quality partnership where short-term investment gives you huge long-term gain. And that's a big gap, I think, for a lot of our organizations in terms of investing the money it takes to do partnership well. I would just say that it's become, I think, a trend now in big urban school districts. In Los Angeles, we have a little bit of everything. I mean, and it's the truth. We have, we're the biggest authorizer of charter schools in the United States. We partner with organizations like the Partnership, with the LA's Promise. We have schools that are run by essentially the teachers. We have schools that are run by nonprofits. School-based health centers. School-based health centers. There's li literally a little bit of everything. And that's not always easy. <laughs> Every one of these partnerships has taken a lot of effort and the political wills. You could say, and we haven't got, we didn't talk a lot about the management labor politics, which always come up in a presidential election, but those are always at the core of a lot of these issues. So it's not always easy, but I think the early results in terms of what has been occurring at these schools have been positive. We, we, I think the district turned a corner when they finally acknowledged, look, it's, we can't do this by ourselves, especially in a district the size and scope of Los Angeles you know, of LA Unified, we need, we need the help of these external partners. And so it's been fairly positive. Now, how scaling up is always an issue, you know, just because you have a good model. Can we do this on a statewide basis? Can we do this on a national basis? Will always be the debate. And I should point out that, uh, in case you're not aware, USC actually yeah. operates a charter yeah. school now yeah. as of about a month ago. Um, in LA Unified. Uh, we have a hybrid high school. It's run by a member of our faculty and he has a whole staff and it's open 12 hours a day, seven days a week and it's uh, this wraparound services model. So this is a, an example of a kind of partnership and I'm one of, one of the um, research activities that I do is I'm on the evaluation committee for that hybrid high school. So we're involved in, because it's important, like you said, when you're trying to scale up, you want to know what's working mm -hmm. and for what kind of kids. And so um, getting into these schools and trying to help figure out what really is working um, and you know what can be scaled up, that's something that I think is very important in an area that USC is contributing. And you guys should be proud of SC. I mean, uh, and this is from a UCLA guy. I'm used to that. Uh, SC is one of the leading universities nationally in terms of actively involving in K-12 education. Most universities, unfortunately, sit it out. Uh, this one is very active in LA in a lot of different areas um, that, that you should be proud of. And with that positive note about USC, <laughs> our time is up. <laughs> last, last plug, though. Ed, Edgar referred to it. This is serious business. The most important issue by far in the ballot, presidential, local, otherwise, is this California funding issue. If Prop 30 loses, we are talking about a 160-day school year. If Prop 30 loses, LA Unified Public Schools, the schools that the kids that I serve every day go to are going to go from what today is already a decreased 175 school year to 160 right after. Regardless of you think it's great policy, there's problems with it, etc. We have a major cliff we fall off if that doesn't get passed. So at a minimum, please understand that resolution of what it does to our public schools because it's devastating. Good last Nonpartisan, I got a plug. I agree. No, I, I fully support it.